academic. So academic transitions from elementary to junior high, basically they go from taking one, being in one class with one primary teacher to all of a sudden having seven different classes with seven different teachers and schedules that are significantly different in time and also in space. So they are moving from one class to another, which they didn't do before. They also have truncated times, not long extended time, but set time periods for each subject. And then to make things even more complicated, they have so many more people, adults, that they have to talk to about themselves. And so it's a very interesting time in their lives. Um, also because the class increase uh, in the track it gives them so many more things to keep track of, uh, not to mention the increase in academic rigor. So things are getting harder, but also increasing in size and demand from them spiritually, emotionally, physically. And so, um, and also we're going from a teacher who knows them in their entire context, right? So we're going from a teacher who knows uh, them as a science student, as a math student, as an English student, and can help understand or understands the student and connect those gaps holistically to teachers who only know them in one context. They only know them as a science student, only know them in math class, only know them. And so now there are multiple layers of relational IQ, EQ that is required for students to navigate not only their social lives, but also and interpersonal lives, but also their academic lives. And so lots and lots of transitions that are happening. Also, there's greater autonomy in what they learn because they are now getting to choose some of their classes. Uh, not a whole lot, not just yet, but they have to make decisions for themselves about their academics and how they want to spend their time. And then also, they have more freedom to manage their work. So their teachers are not so much on top of their work anymore. And usually at this time, there's a little bit of rebellion and also parents kind of tend to take a step back as well. And so there's, they have more freedom to study when they want to, study what they want to. And so this added layer of autonomy also can be very confusing for students to navigate. So um, our philosophy at Eastside is our bridge program, which our two students are going through right now. And that's to, in elementary school, instead of jumping to middle school in sixth grade, what we do is we have a uh, fifth grade with one core teacher, and then in sixth grade, they have two core teachers and elective teachers that they rotate. So they're going from one core teacher to three, core, uh, three primary classes, and then uh, they'll jump to junior high, which is seven. And so we're hoping to kind of mitigate the transitions and also help them uh, kind of manage their courses a little bit better. They start to do things like take midterms and finals uh, for the first time just so that they can kind of ease into some of those harder uh, like coursework uh, material. But it's still going to be a big jump because uh, basically in junior high, these are the classes that students take. They have English, math, uh, a science class, a history class, a Bible class, a PE class, and they also have to take electives. And so next year we're adding a special program, which I'll talk about in a little bit but they have seven classes that they have to take. This is kind of the core specifics, like what is covered in these classes. So English is fundamental. Students have to take English seven in seventh grade, English eight in eighth grade. For math, students have different math tracks that they can get on. And so depending on where they are at the end of sixth grade, we will place them in one of these math classes. And so in junior high, they have three different math courses that they can uh, possibly take either pre-algebra, algebra 1, or geometry. And this also, uh, in eighth grade, will depend on what math they took as a seventh grader. And then for histories, in seventh grade, they take world history, in eighth, they take, eighth, they take US history. And then for sciences, in seventh grade, they take life science, and in eighth grade, they take physical science, which is more like physics and um, applied science. And then they have Bible each year. So seventh grade, they take Old Testament. So eighth grade, they'll take New Testament. Um, they have to take PE both years because we really do believe that physical growth is essential at this time, especially with their hormones and everything. We want to get them all out and, and uh, get those wiggles out. And then uh, students will uh, also take either music, art, and next year we're going to offer intro to Spanish uh, so that they have 
kind of an introductory, um, like, you know, uh, for their language others in English when they get to high school. And then next year, we are going to offer a year-round program called Cornerstone. And Cornerstone basically is a class that's going to help our students with study skills, time management, and accountability. So they'll have a teacher that they report to once a week to learn how to manage their studies better, also time better, and also someone who's checking in on them uh, for every single class they're taking uh, to see if there are any grades that are uh, suffering, any extra help that they need. All of our teachers have additional, like every every single teacher at our school offers office hours uh, at least once a week. So. Uh, for student, but a lot of times students don't utilize those office hours because they either feel like they don't need to or they don't want to. <laughs> and so, but with Cornerstone, what we're hoping is that uh, there can be someone who points them to these resources and actually even makes it mandatory if their grades are at a point where they need that additional layer of support. And so, uh, Cornerstone is something that we're going to implement starting next year and we'll. They'll, students in junior high will have to take Cornerstone both years in seventh and eighth grade, and then we're going to actually also have Cornerstone in ninth grade as well as they transition into high school. And so uh, this is something that we really believe uh, is pivotal to students' life uh, skills and also just um, like well-being, uh, how to help them establish healthy habits because they don't know how to do it on their own. Uh, they need someone to guide them and help them in that. Uh, that is supportive and sometimes not their parents at home, right? Uh, so uh, it helps to have someone else speak that into them. And so those are the classes that our students in junior high will be taking. This is a six year map, so don't be overwhelmed. Um, and we'll send you a picture of this or we'll also send you a copy of this so you know kind of how it works. But basically everything that happens in junior high ultimately leads into high school. And so this is kind of a way to look at everything comprehensively. Um, all, all the years that students are in school, they have to take English because English is a fundamental skill. Reading and writing you have to do for the rest of your life. But depending on how strong they are or their preference for the subject, they start to have more autonomy in the level of English they can take. So if you look at the very left column, uh, you see that students can, starting in ninth grade, either choose to take regular English or honors English. And then in their junior uh, junior year, in 11th grade, they can even take an AP level English class and then have that lead into AP level English in 12th grade. And so uh, there is definitely more autonomy, but also a, a need uh, for students to be more self-aware in what their strengths are academically and also what they're thinking about for high, post high school. So whether that's college or you know, no college, um, where do they want to land uh, will really uh, make a difference in how they choose their courses in high school. So even for English, in fact. And then for math, uh, so if you look up top, uh, at the bottom it says HS, and then I'll say colon, and then a number. Uh, English is required all the years of junior high and high school in order to graduate. Uh, for math, it's required three or up to algebra two to graduate. If you're looking to go to a four-year university uh, uh, that's, you know, uh, more competitive, so let's say Cal State or uh, UC, then it's still it's three years up to algebra two, but it's recommended that you take all four years and up to pre-calculus if you're looking especially at the UCs. And then if you look at science, it's a required two years of a lab science. So lab science means either a biology, chemistry, or physics, um, but if you're looking at the more competitive colleges, then we do recommend three years of science. And so as you can see, the, the higher the grade level, the more options students get, uh, get. And so as students go through junior high and as they start high school and as they go through high school, we will help them uh, in making these decisions based on their performance in their classes and also uh, their goals for post high school. There's also history. So again, with history, it's a required three years because they have to take world history, they have to take US history, and they have to take government and economics, uh, which are one semester classes. So it's a total of three years. Uh, and students can choose to take additional classes in social sciences if they want, but usually it's three years that students take. 
Uh, BPA is Visual Performing Arts, and in order to graduate and in order to go to a four-year university, students have to take at least one year of visual or performing arts. So they can choose either music or art. And that's why in junior high, we have them kind of get a taste of both and see which ones they want to stick with in high school. And then LOTE is language other than English. So, so students have to take at least two years in, uh, in high school to qualify for a four-year in Cal State or UC. To graduate is actually one year, but uh, most of our students are looking to go to college, a four-year university, and so we do recommend at least two years. If you are looking at more competitive colleges, then you want to take at least three years of a foreign language or a language other than English. And so at our school, we currently offer Spanish, uh, starting next year, we're hoping to also offer Korean, and so we'll have opportunities for students to take either or, and we hope to offer both levels of TEP um, by their senior year. And then for us, Bible is required all four years, so it is a graduation requirement. We believe that it's fundamental to faith education, and then they also have other classes that they can choose from. And so other classes uh, for, uh, for seventh through ninth, they will have to take Cornerstone. Uh, it can be optionally taken in 10th, 11th, and 12th, especially if the student is, have, is someone who struggles more with their academics. Uh, but students also have other opportunities like sports. So in order to graduate from high school, students have to have two years of physical education. So PE is required for two years, but students can substitute PE with a sport. So if they want to take like, basketball or volleyball, that's an option that they have once they get into high school. In junior high, students must take their PE class, but they can take a uh, sport as an extracurricular activity. So if you want to do volleyball on the side, uh, it can actually prime them for volleyball in high school if you want to continue that in high school. Uh, and so they can choose to do that. Um, they will also, also have other options like ASV, uh, so the student leadership team, as well as worship team. We're hoping to offer worship team as an elective next year. And so they'll have one set designated class where they are uh, taking part in building um, and also curating like, songs, the time of worship with the students, and so that it can be taken also as an elective. So this is kind of the map of high school starting in junior high. You can see how it's so uh, integrated, right? Like you can't separate junior high and high school. And it's really important for parents to see the big picture because ultimately you have to help them understand the big picture. It can't be something that just comes from school. And also we have to be in on the same page about what we are helping them understand about the future. It all builds up, right? And so uh, it's really hard for students to shift gears, um, especially like when they get to 10th grade or 11th grade, if they don't have the foundations uh, to make those shifts. And so um, this is really important for our parents and our students to all be on the same page about. So we'll be going over this with the students too, and we'll share this also just as a separate document with you all. One thing that I did want to mention, academics is really important, but even more important, or as important in junior high, is recognizing our students' talents, um, non-academic talents. Uh, so all of our students have potential beyond their academics. Their intellect is one of their greatest assets, but also their God-given talents music or arts or creativity or leadership or athletics is something that you know they really come to realize in their junior high school years and actually if they don't recognize their potential in those two pivotal years uh, it's really hard for them to gain confidence or build uh, their talents uh, to pursue it in, uh, in high school and beyond and so um, it's really important that they're not ignored because that can actually stunt their growth in those things. It can also discourage them um, in those things, uh, but also because uh, they have to recognize in order to explore it. And junior high is such a great time to explore it. Once they get into high school, things matter more. Their time matters more, their grade matters more, uh, their relationships matter more. And so because there's more emphasis and more uh, weight to their decisions in high school, they don't have as much time or the freedom to explore and figure out the things that they like and don't like. And so junior high is such a crucial time for them to more freely, without the pressures, explore and recognize these gifts. And so that's why we want to give our students opportunities uh, beyond just their academics to see. Uh, and they, they might have had gifts and talents that they had already been exploring in elementary school, 
but so much is happening in them in junior high that they might have other gifts that come out at that time. So maybe a student was very good at sports growing up in elementary school, but now they have a year for music or they love to doodle. Like junior high is the time to let them try different things to see what they want to continue to cultivate. And also because what they cultivate in junior high is most likely what they'll continue to invest in in high school. So if students don't start that investment period in junior high, by the time they get to high school, there are too many pressures, social pressures, uh, like parent pressure, uh, just their own self pressure. So they, it squashes their desire to want to pursue anything else once they get into high school. So junior high is really a pivotal time for them to explore. And so what we want to do, uh, how we help them to kind of explore these things is, first of all, so service hours are required for our students. Service hours not necessarily to explore their extracurriculars or their other gifts. Primarily, it's to help them see their place in the world and also help them understand how to be a part of the world, right? Where does God want, how does God want me to help the world? And it doesn't have to be specific. It doesn't have to be like, I'm going to be a doctor or I'm going to be a lawyer. It could just be just the realization that even as a student, I have a role to play, right? Even as a student, I can help and be hand in hand with Jesus. Like, it's to help them make those connections uh, with their place in the world. And so service hours, and, and then service hours can also help them see, like, the need in the world. Like, oh my gosh, like, I did not know that there were people who were suffering in this way. Or I did not know that people had these kinds of jobs. Like, it really just helps them to understand what is out there and the world that they are part of. And so service hours are required starting in junior high, 15 hours per semester, 30 hours total. And so students can do this in multiple ways. They can either help out on our school campus in different operations in our school. So right now, not to call him out, but we have Dream who's helping out in our front office. Actually, we had no idea that he's so talented in organizational skills and also like leadership. Like we had no idea, but he just started to see like, how about if we do it this way? Or how about we do it this way? And he just like, he started making suggestions and he liked spending time in the office. And so now he's exploring parts of him that he didn't even realize he had or he, uh, you know, the gifts he had. And so we were being so blessed by that. We also have other opportunities like peer tutoring. Uh, we have a basketball clinic that our students can help out with. We have daycare. Uh, students can help with daycare, uh, helping students with homework, reading to them, uh, just taking care of them while they're um, doing their work. Uh, we also have opportunities like Love Fullerton where, where we like actually help with physical parts of our school, uh, physical improvements, facility improvements. And so there are different ways that students can help out on our school campus, but we also really encourage students to go beyond our school campus. So Love Fullerton doesn't have to be on our campus. It could be somewhere else uh, at, a, at a park or, you know, um, at a nursing home or somewhere else where students can really see the world beyond our school walls. So we really encourage that. It could be at church, uh, it could be like at a you know, elderly person's house, anything uh, that is giving back to the community. Uh, and then sports, we have uh, volleyball available for junior high this year. We're really hoping to start a basketball clinic for our students next year as well. And so uh, those opportunities will be open to our students. We had a dance team this year for our Christmas performance and our junior high school girls loved it and they were so amazing. So we're hoping to also offer that uh, this coming year. And so different opportunities for students to take part in uh, the musical and the artistic, creative, and also athletic parts of our school uh, and themselves to recognize those gifts in themselves. Uh, we also have a music production club. So I don't know if you guys saw, but we had students contribute to a song. They wrote all the lyrics, they filmed the music video, uh, they sang the parts, and it was amazing. And they also actually right now are already working on another song. And so we just love seeing those things come out in our students. Like some of our students were like, wow, we had no idea you could sing. We had no idea you could rap. You know, like they didn't even know. So just like getting those, you know, and they can do it so freely and openly because there's no pressure. Right? And that's so important that they get that freedom to do that. Um, and then even leadership. Like when we see students together, like we had, uh, so Mrs. Lee and her family, we've been hosting this 
dinners for each grade. And, you know, outside of school, and even like when they are together, we start to see things that we don't get to see in classrooms, like their humor, <coughs> how they interact with each other. And we saw like, wow, like actually this kid has such a voice. People listen to this kid's voice. Man, we should really pray and encourage them to take more leadership positions. This student is so encouraging, so positive. Man, we really want this student to be a part of building up the student class. Like we get to see these things in our students and we want them to be a part of uh, just cultivating our school and take more ownership of the school that they're at. And so we really encourage them to be a bigger voice at our school. And so hopefully next year we'll have leadership opportunities for our students, even if it's not ESP specifically, different ways that students can take part in that. So with all that being said, expectations for junior high, uh, some things that parents should know is the homework load will increase year by year. So every year they're getting, and it should be, right? And I think that's something that our parents need to encourage our students in because, uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, but for some reason, our students get bigger and taller and, you know, so they eat more and they wear bigger clothes and no one, like that's expected, right? Like we all grow and that's, yeah, like that's the natural progression. But for some reason with our intellect, our students still want to do the same amount of homework as they did when they're in second grade, when they're in seventh and eighth and ninth and tenth and eleventh grade. And see, that is so number one how we are framing the understanding of homework and academics, right? Um, and then how they are internalizing it. So there are four things that students really need to thrive. Number one, they have to have a sense of competence. They have to know that they are good at. If they don't feel like they are good at it, it automatically shuts down their confidence and really demoralizes them. Secondly, they need a sense of belonging. They, they have to feel like I'm a part of this thing that I'm in right now. Thirdly, they have to have a sense of autonomy and ownership. So they have to know that what they are doing contributes to uh, them and what's happening in their lives and that it's not something that's being dictated over them. And so especially in seventh grade and eighth grade, when their minds are being open to all these different influences, they're getting to decide things about their lives and they're hearing opinions that are beyond their home and beyond their school. And they have to have a sense of, I'm choosing to do this because I know that this is good for me versus I have to do it because I've been told that this is what I'm supposed to do. There's such a big difference in that that small mindset shift will either have a make your child miserable or make your child flourish so it's really really important that we are providing that sense of ownership in their studies not just in other decisions that they're making but even in their homework so how are we framing homework for them yeah you're going to get more homework because you're getting smarter you're learning more and so you have to cultivate that more. Therefore, you're going to have more homework. How are we framing that conversation with our students? Or is it, you got to do it, or you're going to flunk your classes, right? Like, how are we framing that conversation? And how are we helping them to understand that uh, and take ownership of that? They're also going to be tested more. So as I mentioned, we have, they have midterms and finals. Not all junior high schools have midterms and finals. We purposely include midterms and finals so that they get ready for high school. But even that, like how do we understand different weights in academics? Um, we also have standardized testing. So when they get into eighth grade, we have PSATs that they really need to take. And so not for any other reason than to, these are standards uh, nationwide, and these are expectations as you go into high school. So where are you at? Like, let's see. Let's self-examine. Where is your level of self-awareness? Let's see how we're doing academically. And not to make you feel bad or to feel good, just to see what areas we want to grow in and what areas need to be cultivated more, right? So those are things that students need to think about. And so how are we as staff, as faculty, as parents, framing testing? Like, you gotta do well or you're gonna shame me. No, how are we, gonna, how are we framing this, right? Like, okay, well, what is a test? Let's help them understand what a test is. 
It's just a measure of where you're at right now intellectually, right? No pressure. Let's just see where you're at and see what you need to work on. How are we framing this at home? Leadership. We are expecting our students to take a bigger role at school. So we are expecting our students to, in their autonomy, in their freedom, uh, be willing to invest in some of the things that are happening. And actually, our seventh and eighth graders are amazing. Our seventh and eighth graders had the biggest showing at our dance this year. <laughs> like our first dance, like they're pretty much all of them were there, um, and they're also like so happy and eager to engage. We don't want to lose that when they get to ninth grade, and so we want to cultivate that and really boost that as they graduate from junior high. So leadership expectations, and last but not least, community engagement. We really want them to start seeing beyond their school, so that they can see how their character, their academics, who they are contributes to the greater world around them. So this is these are the things that we're expecting from our students. So how does this all tie into spiritual, social, and emotional health? We talked about this a little bit, but they are so much more self-aware. They are, even now in the sixth grade, I'm sure uh, you see this at home, but their bodies are changing. They're aware that their bodies are changing. A lot of times, it, it leads to insecurities. I want to hide, or I don't want to show, or I want to cover, right? Even in boys and girls, like their emotions, um, they're more aware of their emotions. I'm more angry. I'm more sad. Like, they're so much more dramatic, aren't they? Like six and seven grade, they're so dramatic. But it's because they understand now that they are like emotions, like so much emotions. And so, and they're more aware of their opinions, right? It's not just what mom says or dad says or brother says or sister says. It's what I say, like what I think. And I heard this, so I'm going to fight back, right? So they're, they're becoming more and more self-aware. So how are we helping them navigate that? Are we squashing it or how are we helping them cultivate it? So, okay, what are these thoughts that you're having? Let's talk about it, you know? Like, okay, yeah, you're feeling these things. You know, do you know why these things, like why are you feeling these things? Let's talk about it. Um, how should we navigate it? Yeah, you're feeling more strongly about things, but let's think about how we should deal with that, how we should manage it. So when you're getting these feelings, you're feeling angry, you're feeling sad. Um, how, what are your, what are, what is the process you're, you're um, taking? Are you just leaning into the anger, or are you asking, okay, is this, is this something that, is this the right reaction I should be having? Let's talk about how we should be managing this spiritually. Are you inviting God into the situation? Are your actions, are your emotions because of your, uh, are your actions because of your emotions causing harm to others? We really have to start having these conversations with our students so that their self-awareness doesn't lead to self-destruction. And junior high is a time when many, many students fall into depression, uh, suicidal, self-harm uh, tendencies, peer pressure, so eating disorders, um, like all of these things usually really start to manifest in junior high. And most of the time it's because they're becoming more and more self-aware without the tools to navigate those things. And so we have to work in tandem. It's not just what happens at home. It's not just what happens at school. It's the integration of those two things. And if there's a disconnect between home and school and church, that's a lot of confusion. So they start to lean on the things that they like or depend on most. And right now, for a lot of students, that's social media. They trust social media more than parents or even teachers because they feel more heard and seen by social media than they do at home or in school. And so how do we help our students to not fall into that pit and fall into destructive habits? We have to be the ones that are shepherding them through the self-awareness process. Otherwise, someone else will lead them. Someone else will lead them. They're being led by somebody. Let's not have that be somebody who is not us, right? We have to help them through this process. Secondly, they're learning how to manage themselves too. They have increased decision making, what they, what, when they sleep, when they eat, what they eat, and also what they do in their free time. So our junior high school students, we can't tell them what to do, right? Like we can't tell them get off your phone because they're they're gonna find their way to get back on their phones. Or and if you do that, if there's a tighter, tighter 
script that you're taking on your students that make people further and distance themselves further and further from you, right? We see that happening all the time, even with in our classrooms with our teachers. So how are we having those conversations? How are we encouraging them to be autonomous in their decision making um, while guiding them properly, right? And so how are we talking about things like time management, eating, and sleeping? Um, how are we helping them to choose uh, to not indulge in things like social media or movies or games? Right? And then they're also more aware of each, each other. Um, my place in my school and my social circles, they're much more aware of the people that are around them. And they're also more aware of their spirituality. Like they're starting to think about like, what is my place in the world? It's so crazy, right? But our students are having very existential thoughts about who they are and how they fit in this world at this age. And we hear our chapels are pretty amazing. And our seventh and eighth graders, they sometimes will ask questions like, I don't know why God put me in this world. Like, I don't know why I'm here. Like, these are really deep thoughts that they're having. And are we just having them brush that under the rug? Or are we helping them think these? Not that they have to know right now. Like, are you digging in yourself? Right? Like, we're all searching and we're all growing constantly. But how are we having those conversations and helping them uh, towards the right path? Um, and last but not least, they're building relational skills with at home, with parents. And I'm sure there are shifts in your relationships with your students. Uh, Sixth, seventh, eighth, and then ninth, they're very different uh, relational times in between the parent and the child. Um, with their family members, um, with their siblings, if they have siblings, or even um, their grandparents, or their aunts and uncles, their friends, and even other adults. So how they start to treat teachers. We see a huge difference in how our sixth graders are versus our seventh graders. It's a whole world apart, even though it's just one grade. And then we see from seventh to eighth, a whole, whole other world between those two grades because they're understanding themselves relationally in each of those years. And so how are we helping them navigate that? So one of the things that we really, really pray for at our school is not that we're just teaching them intellect, but we're teaching them how to do life. We're doing life with them. How are you communicating with people? Are you making eye contact? Are you saying hello? Uh, even with your emails, like are you just like, saying what you need to say and not explaining, or are you putting a greeting and, an, and like and a salutation at the end? Like we're teaching, we're we're teaching them how to be people in this world. And it's so important that that's consistent at home, at school, in the rest of their life. So um, this is all very, very much integrated. And students who know how to talk to people, usually, it's not even how smart you are. The most successful people in life usually are people who are able to communicate their ideas and thoughts with other people in a way that is relatable and understandable to others. You cannot be, you're not, no one is an island. We are all relational beings. So how are we helping our students to be people in this world that are light and salt, right? We really want our students to be people who are communicating the love, sharing the love and the gifts of Jesus, right? So we really need to help them do this well. So it has to be in congruence at home and at school. How are we teaching them to be better relationally? And obviously physically, they grow exponentially. There are hormones, there are sleep cycles that change, their eating habits that change. And this one, I mean, I really, because there are some students at our school that don't eat lunch or breakfast. Some of them eat lunch but or breakfast, but it's like ramen or you know, like chips at like nine in the morning. Like, oh my gosh, you're just putting chemicals into your body. So how are we helping them understand like what is going in your body, how that affects not only your physical, but your mental, your emotional, all of those things are interconnected. So how are we helping them navigate those things? And also self-image, like, and you know, honestly, I think even more than the, like girls will, they become much more aware of how they look. And then boys turn the other corner. They start to ignore the way we look. It's very strange, <laughs> but it happens because there's so many like physical changes that are happening. 
So how are we helping our students understand the physical well-being? You know, are you well? Like, it's not about what society tells us to look like. Are you actually physically well? Because how you are, are you drinking enough water? We, our students know, like, when I come up to them during lunch, they, they know what I'm going to ask. Like, did you drink water? Did you eat lunch? Like, they know what I'm going to ask because those things are so essential to them functioning well throughout the day. And so is that same conversation happening at home? And do they know that their physical well-being is so important and crucial to their development as people? So this is something that's really, really important. So in order for students to succeed in junior high school, first of all, they have to have a sense of belonging. And so that's why for us, our school is just such a great haven for our students. We want it to be a slightly bigger haven, but it's a great haven because it's a place where students can feel safe and they feel seen and heard by each other, but with staff and faculty too. Um, it's really important that they know that they are somewhere where they're cared for. That safety part is crucial. If there's no trust, if there's no sense of safety, if they feel like they're going to be attacked, then they cannot flourish. They cannot grow. Mentally, physically, emotionally, well, maybe physically, but emotionally and spiritually, they'll be stunted. And so it's really important, even at home, that they have a sense of belonging. Also, students' perception of school is so vital for success. If they think of school as something they have to get through, they're not going to maximize their potential. If they don't see school as a way that is cultivating their growth, they're not going to be because it's not theirs, right? It's not theirs, it's something that they have to do. So how are we having that conversation with them? Yeah, they have to be here, but actually, I mean, if they really don't want to, I guess they don't have to, right? But how are we having that conversation with them, encouraging them to take and see school in a positive light? And so for me, as an administrator, I really, really try not to say things like, yay, it's Friday, because what's the opposite connotation of that? We're not at, being at school is good. Being not at school is good. That's what we're telling them, right? Um, oh, like, you know, hurry up and finish your homework so we can do this instead. That's also, okay, homework is so horrible. It's a way to get to this better thing, right? Like, how are we framing those conversations? How are we helping, even for us, like, how are we understanding school? Because students just feed off of what's being said and heard around them. And so, Really, like framing the perception of school in their minds is really, really important. Otherwise, it's just jail. We've had students say that to us. School is jail. <laughs> like, no, school is a place where you get to grow and learn. It's such a, it should be positive. But why don't we, why are they not able to see that? It's not just what happens at home, but home and school and outside, all of that makes it. Levels of teacher supportiveness. That's why we spend so much time having our teachers talk to our students, uh, have office hours, encourage them to come to office hours, uh, and also encourage them to do extracurricular activities so they can bond with teachers in a different way. It's also why we, as administrators, try to get to know our students because if they know that they are supported and loved, then they will be free to be themselves and to grow and make mistakes. They have to be okay with being mistakes and how to get up from making mistakes is part of life. Uh, we have to help them to learn how to do that well in a safe environment where they feel seen, heard, and supported. And then also, presence of good friends. Um, who are they being surrounded by? What are they being told in their social circles? Um, how are they engaging, not just with the immediate, but in the future and even in their past? How are we helping them connect all their experiences with all that's to come, right? Um, and then disciplining in a fair and effective way. So not just having discipline that's really polarizing, but a way that's fair and actually constructive. If you've been disciplining your students one way, and we tell this to our teachers too, if you've been trying to speak to them in one way, and we practice this, I practice this every day, the way to discipline students is different based on the student. Like, and if you're trying, if you're doing the same thing over and over again, and they keep doing the same thing over and over again, you gotta think outside, you gotta, you gotta find a different way, because it's not working, right? So how are we being fair and effective in how we speak life into our students? And also, how are we uh, encouraging them to participate in something other than just their school classes? How are we helping them to see the world beyond them? 
and how are we helping them to build healthy habits? That's really, really important. The things they do every day become habit. If they keep doing one thing over and over again, it's in 21 days it becomes a habit. It takes more than three months to break a habit, but it takes only 21 days to make a habit, form a habit. So at home, we're really hoping that parents will help set a mindset of exploration and hope. How they're framing the future, how they're framing school, how they're talking about hard things, more in terms of exploration and hope than of uh, accomplishments or threats or disappointment even. Um, so we have to, at home and at school, model an attitude of excitement and wonder. Are you showing them that learning is exciting? Are you learning, right? So I'm just gonna throw this out there. So like, you know, so one of the ways that you can kind of understand and get to know a college's um, personality or character is in the essays that they have students write. And so one of the colleges, uh, a very big name college, in one of their essays asks, uh, what, what excites you and why? That's their essay prompt for college, their college application. And I always challenge our parents to think about that. Do you have something that excites you and can you write an essay about it? If you can't, how can you expect your students to, right? So are you having, are you modeling this attitude of wonder and excitement? Because that's what they see at home. If you don't have wonder and excitement at home, they will not be excited or be in wonder, right? So we have to help them cultivate that at home. And secondly, are we holding expectations that are biblical or worldly? That's something that's really important for us to think about. As administrators, we wrestle with that every day. And I hope you are too at home because what are we teaching our students? You know, um, are, you, are we forcing, you gotta be smart, or you gotta make a lot of money, you gotta have a good job, or are we, are we cultivating spiritual gifts in our students? How are we speaking to people around you? Are you being kind? Are you, are you being loving? Um, are you being prayerful in your decision making? Or are you trying to get uh, the best uh, thing for the class? Like, how are we cultivating biblical uh, perceptions and understanding of the world versus what is worldly expectations? And then, are we engaging in discussions about the why or the what? Right? Instead of telling them, do this, do that, are we saying, hey, how about we do this because, because, or how, if, you, if students made a certain decision, instead of saying, why did you do that, or what is that that you did, or that's bad, are we encouraging them to think about, okay, well, this was a mistake, or it was a failure on your end, but why, what, let's think about why this is not good, right, and how we do not make this mistake again, or how we do not disappoint in this way again. So are we engaging in conversations that are punitive for the action or really helping them think about their inner selves and their character? How are we communicating? Is it clear? Are your expectations for your students clear? And is it kind, right? Uh, students are turned off immediately if they feel like they're like under attack, right? I mean, people are, all people in general, not just students but especially so when they are emotional and sensitive and hormonal, right? <laughs> They're even more so at that age. And so how are we clear, how are we communicating that is it clear and is it kind? Uh, because, um, so one of the examples is, is there an appropriate emphasis on academics? Or is academics the end all? Or is it nothing? That's also, we gotta think about that too. How are we, are we polarizing academics, or is it something that has an appropriate amount of weight, right? So even thinking about that, like how are you talking about school and academics to your students? Um, are we overemphasizing it? Are we underemphasizing it? What is more important, your grades or your well-being, right? How are we having those conversations? Are we focusing on effort or outcome, right? Um, some students, they try, 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 and First, every subject, it might be different. Some students get math right away. Some students, it takes them a long time. Some students really, really excel in history, and some students really, really don't. Like, they, they have a hard time making those positive connections. So 
are we focusing on the effort that they're putting in or are we just focusing on the grades that they're getting play? Are we focusing on character or are we, are we focusing on accomplishments? These are really important things to think about. Um, how are these things being communicated? Are we encouraging a burning? So there's a lot of research done on the words that are spoken, right? And this is so biblical. It says the word, it's like your words um, bring life or death. Right? Our tongue is a very powerful weapon. It can be a weapon or it can be uh, something that is a tool, a powerful tool. And students, every, and this is adults too, um, for every three things, negative, uh, three positive things, and one negative thing is. So we have to encourage and affirm our weak because they hear less of the affirmation and more. And especially at that time in their lives when they're trying to figure out their identity and when they're so insecure about everything, their body, their emotions, their place in the world, it's so, so important. And I'm just going to go back to that place in the hierarchy. There shouldn't be a hierarchy, but there is a hierarchy. There's high school, which are the big dogs, and then there's junior high, and then there's elementary school, right? In sixth grade, they're at the top of the game because they're at the highest level of elementary they, you know, six years they went through the grind, and then now they're at the top. So they're on top of the world. And then when they come into seventh grade, um, at least in our school, it's a little bit, the transition is easier because they have still our elementary school that they can refer back to. But if you look at the junior high and high school progression, junior high seventh graders are at the bottom of the food chain. So they are now at the lowest part of the total pool and they have to build their way up and so honestly it's really like their their sense of self is at the most unstable in seventh and eighth grade and so how are we either like adding to the instability or helping that firm up it's really important that there are things not not luck right not just oh you're beautiful just so that they can hear that you're beautiful like, like real life things hey, you did a really great job today, or I just really love the way you smiled today, or I just really am so thankful that you're my daughter or my son. Affirmations that are true and life-giving need to be heard at least two, three times a day from you at home in order for them to feel a sense of stability and security when they go to school. Because there's so many things that add to uh, the instability in their, in their heart and in their soul at this time. And also, it's really important that you limit transitions at home, as well as create healthy rhythms. Because again, this instability with all these changes, going from three classes to seven classes, going from being the top dogs to the underdogs, all these and all the body stuff, so many things that are unstable in their lives, it's so important that you limit tra transitions at home. You have to create a stable, rhythms are you have to create stable rhythms in life even as simple as like when you wake up or who takes them to school to whether or not you eat together for dinner right those things like stability and consistency and healthy habits those things have to be well established at home in order for them to flourish outside of the home uh, and so these are some things that will add to or help their success and you have to model it so if you're telling your kids to go sleep early and you sleep at one in the morning, it's not gonna happen. They see hypocrisy right away. Or if you say eat healthy, eat healthy, and then you're going through the drive-through every other day, not gonna help with the eating habits. You know, so it's really or if you say, hey, be kind in your communication, and then you have fights with your other kids or with your you know spouse or if you say, hey, I want you to communicate well to me, then you go and you fight with your mom and your grandma. We have to model the behavior that we want to see in our students because they see and they do. They see and they do, you know? No matter how much you tell them, unless they're seeing it, they're not gonna, they're not gonna live it. And at this age, hypocrisy is on their radar. <laughs> you didn't do it. How come you have, I have to do it? You're not cleaning your room. How come I have to clean my room, right? They are so on high alert because they're more self-aware, more aware of themselves and about the world around them. And so it's really, really important that there's consistency, there's modeling of behavior at home. And our role in all of this is that we will provide the comprehensive counseling, the 
first of all, we are going to do our best to help them be excited about the future. There's hope for them in the future. Now and forever. Because we're loved by Jesus. And he gives us all these gifts and all these ways to flourish in this world. And we, we in every turn, we're going to help them understand that. We're going to speak that into them so that they feel the excitement and understand their place in this world. We're also going to do this with their extracurricular activities. We're, we're really trying to build opportunities for them at our school uh, to go beyond their academics. And so just the things that we mentioned today, they're just some of the things that we want to do moving forward. And so we, we hope that there will be more opportunities moving forward. But we're going to help them all tie all this together. It's not just about your spiritual, just about your academics, just about your social and emotional. All of these things are integrated. That is the whole thing. It's not segregated. And so our job is, as a school, to help them understand the big picture, the whole picture. And then also, we're going to support, our teachers are going to support them all the way. We really, really try to have our teachers really speak life into them. And all of our teachers are so different, and that's what's amazing too. Now they get seven teachers. It's overwhelming, yes, but also there's seven different people who can speak life into them. Some of them they'll connect with, some of them they won't. But they have opportunities to get to, to know different types of people in this world, and we're going to make sure that they're supported. And then, obviously, the extracurricular outlets, as well as leadership opportunities. We want to give them a voice. We have some amazing sixth graders. We have some amazing seventh graders. We have some amazing, interesting eighth graders. We are so excited to cultivate uh, their leadership uh, potential with us. And so these are the ways that we will walk with you and journey with you through this process. And we have to be in communication. Um, we're going to make sure that our students come and talk to us at least twice a year. Uh, that's also another reason why we want to be cornerstone because we want to not just look at their academics in an isolated way, but we want to look at it comprehensively and holistically. Um, but we also need to hear from you, too. And so I know the trend is, so even, we see this even in field trips. Our kindergarten parents are usually the most eager to try different field trips. We have like five, six moms in kindergarten that want to come and join us. And then it's like slowly but surely, you know, fewer and fewer, like the older they get, the less interested they are. The one exception is Mrs. Kim, honestly, because she has four kids and she still comes to the youngest one's field trip. But usually it's like, yeah, by the time you get to like your second or third kid and they're in like seventh and eighth grade, it's like, oh, they can just win their own life, right? But actually, when parent, even if they don't, they say they don't like it, when, when students see that their parents are interested in what's happening, when they come and they invest in their school, it changes the student's outlook on the parent and also on school and themselves in a very positive way because they, see, they feel seen and they feel invested in. And so uh, please, I hope that you won't wane in your involvement. I know all of you are so busy. I, you're all, I totally understand. Life is busy and <coughs> life is a lot, but whatever opportunities we have to connect, we do hope that we see you uh, at our school and be a part of the because those things will uh, make an impact on your students and on the student body, too. Also because, don't you want to know who your kids are hanging out with? That's really important to you. So even with like things like sleepovers and hangouts, as much as possible, I encourage you to host it just so that you, can, you don't have to hang out with them, right? They could just be at your house. But inviting kids to your house so they know, they can see how it you can see how they interact. It's such a great way for you to gain insight into their world. Um, and also a way for you to show them that you care. Like, hey, I care about who you're hanging out with. I care about what you guys are talking about. Like, I'm not going to tell you exactly what to say or do, but I want to invest in that part of your life too. And when they see that that part of life is also something that you care about, they'll care about it more too. Oh, mom cares about who I hang out with. Mom cares about what I say with my friends. It's harder and harder for them to live realistically. And can I just be very honest, especially in the Korean American community, there's a lot of duplicity in our, in our kids because they're usually very churched, right? But then they're also very influenced by the, other, like, by the world. So how they are at church and at home can 
sometimes it's like one baby and how many are outside. And so, and that divide gets further and further the older they get. And that starts, that division really starts to happen. And so one way for you to make sure that your students stay whole and you know consistent is to understand every part of their life. It doesn't mean you have to be a part of everything they do. Like, please don't go watch movies with your kids friends. They'll hate it. But you know, like, just like, you know, like, who are your friends that you're hanging out with? You know, like, what you guys do today? Like, why don't you invite them over for dinner? Like, if you hang out with that kid a lot, like, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll give you your favorite dish and you guys can just hang out and play video games at our house. That's a really, really great way for you to see what their life is like to see too. And it's really important that you are part of that too. So anyway, all of these things, socially, spiritually, emotionally, physically, academically, everything is integrated. And so we hope that we can journey with you in really loving our kids uh, holistically. And whether you like it or not, we're in this together. And so we do hope uh, that it's more of a partnership and not something that's segregated. So any questions, concerns, that brings us to the end. So we'll share the academic stuff with you, um, for the classes that they're going to be taking. Um, what we're also hoping to do with electives is that they can get a taste of everything. So uh, if they take like one semester of Spanish, one semester of music, the next year then they, they can take one semester of art, one semester of whatever they want to take, just so they get a taste of what they might want to achieve in high school. Uh, again, this really contributes to autonomy. They can choose what they like. Um, and they can see and explore the potential in these things. So that's what we're hoping with the academic. And please also encourage your students to engage extracurricularly too, because really, it really is so important in how they continue to pursue their whole being, uh, especially as they enter high school. Okay, well, either, uh, yeah, we, we're here if you have any questions, please let us know. Question. Yes. Do you guys have any summer programs? Yes. Yes. Great question. So yes, we do. So we have a program for six, seventh, and eighth graders, rising six, seventh, and eighth. Um, we primarily focus on reading, writing, uh, reading, writing, critical thinking because usually that's what students struggle the most with. Um, so we have a program that's just Monday through Thursday, uh, nine to one. Um, and for our students only. We're, it's not being cared, but we are going to offer an after after program opportunity, extracurricular opportunity. Um, so instead of because so a couple of things for junior high school students, um, it's first of all really really hard to manage them <laughs> like after school because <laughs> they just have a mind of their own and they just, it's really hard being at school for like you know four hours in the summer and then see another you know, three hours and have to listen to someone, like, they just feel trapped and they, like, lose that sense of autonomy and they start to hate it. And so, um, for all of those reasons, we don't have, like, a, an after program, like, a full day program, but we do want to give our students more leadership opportunities. So we are going to offer, for our students only, a chance to TA and help out with our summer program for K-5. to So if you want Olivia to come and help out with the summer program, she can stay for the uh, morning writing and reading, and then stay an additional however long, uh, and then help out with our K through fifth program. Our K through fifth program goes until 5:30, and so if they're here, they're helping out. They can get service hours for that for the school year, and also it just gives them more ownership of our campus and more leadership opportunities. Um, you know, uh, both their communication. So actually, for our summer program, our discount, uh, so we have a 10% discount for our summer program. That ends, so we have significantly lower rates for our Eastside students in the We love our Eastside families. Uh, but then we, uh, that discount ends, and we have an additional 10% on the already discounted tuition, and that ends this Wednesday. So if you're interested, yeah, this coming Wednesday uh, on the 15th. So, oh, this during the summer, I didn't see that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, the best way to kind of keep track of what's happening is the emails that we send out every week and then our YouTube um, channel. Oh, I have to see on the website. Yeah, yeah. The, the email should have it this week. Last week we forgot it, but we sent out a separate email about the, the summer program. But oh, okay. yeah, we 
can you can also oh, yeah. and you have also the clean, clean out the paper too. Yeah, my kids brought the paper. Oh, oh okay. yes, 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 oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Yeah. 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 No worries. No worries. That's why we like try to communicate like uh -huh. multiple times different ways. But yeah, that's a great option. Okay. Summer. Yeah. Good. Also, it's important for them to do something in the summer. So even if they don't come here, you should make sure that they're not just rolling around at home. Um, and the reason why this is important is because actually summer break is not educationally a sound system. Uh, it's an antiquated system. It started because of the agricultural, you know, kind of history of our country and farmers needed their children during the three months of summer mm -hmm. so they couldn't go to school because they had to help out the farm. Mm -hmm. Very, very antiquated. We should have gotten rid of a long time ago. That's why sometimes mm -hmm. you'll hear about like year-round schools and things like that. Three, three months stretch of doing nothing intellectual really, really is detrimental to students at that age, especially. And so it's really important that they're engaging somehow with their minds. And so either getting them to a reading program or doing like additional math, or it doesn't have to be full day. And we actually discourage that because we don't want to burn them out. But it is important that they're using their mind some way or another during the two and a half months they have off of school. Or they're going to come back and not be ready for the next year. Mm -hmm. Yes. Are they going to have lunch for summer? Yes. Or if they stay. Or if they stay yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. If they, if they, stay. they don't stay <laughs> until one, then no. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. so you know, for their service, we will pay them with food. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> There's no extra for PA. No, no, no. They, I mean, for, they're basically. So you're going to actually have a separate TA training. So they're not going to just be here and just play with each other. You're, if that happens, we're just going to send them home. But we're going to have a separate TA training so that they know their responsibilities, their role in the classroom. So, you know, as TAs, they're working with us. And so we can keep them as kids. <laughs> Great question. Any other questions? I mean, I'm sure there will be more. Please, please feel free to reach out anytime. Uh, Simon and I are here to answer any questions and to do anything for you. So, and so we can pray and then we can go. Lord, we, we're just so thankful, God, um, that we get to be a part of um, these junior high schoolers' lives, God. And it is such a privilege. You have so uniquely created each and every one of these children um, to be uniquely yours. And God, what an honor and a joy it is to get to know them um, and who they are and to help them come to fulfillment in you and to reach their potential and to be the people that you have created them to be. God, what an amazing um, privilege it is that we get to be a part of that. Lord, we're just so grateful. Um, no matter how many schools we work at or how many students we interact with, every single one, uh, no matter how many children we have, every single one is so unique. And Lord, we just thank you that we get to be a part of those unique lives. God, we just want to be good stewards of this time with them. Lord, we know that it's a pivotal time. Uh, and God, we know that there are many things um, to factor into every day. God, all we can to do is lean on you. And Lord, the way that you shepherd us here is how we can shepherd our children. So God, we just, um, with all these things, God, academically, emotionally, physically, spiritually, Lord, uh, we first uh, entrust that, Lord, you love these children more than you can ever love them. And God, we just want to love them in a way that honors you and loves them well. So Father, would you continue to Give us wisdom and insight. Would you continue to teach us and grow up, Lord, and give us hope so that we can uh, do the same for our students and our children. We thank you for these parents who love their children so much that they are taking the evening to be here and to consider all these things. Father, would you bless them with rest, uh, with goodness, with hope, with laughter and joy. Lord, so that we can obey and be loved and cherished by you too. Uh, Father, we are all your children. And Father, your heart is to 
content for each and every one of us. Father, I pray that as we leave here tonight, that we remember how much you are loved and cared for by you. We thank you and we pray all of these things to you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. 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 Thank